One of the enemy's favorite tools for discouraging Christians is the question, what if? Unfortunately, those what if questions lead right down the road to fear. Hi, I'm Rob West. The Bible reminds us that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. So you don't have to let the what ifs defeat you. We'll talk about that today, and then we'll take your calls at 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. This is Faith and Finance Live, biblical wisdom for your financial journey. How many times have you worried about your finances, asking those scary what-if questions like, what if I lose my job? What if I don't have enough money for retirement? What if something bad happens to me or my loved ones? The problem with this kind of thinking is that it focuses on events that haven't happened yet or may never happen. We can't control the future, but we certainly like to worry about it, don't we? God knows this about us, which is why Jesus reminded his disciples in Matthew 6, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? You and I can't control the future, but we can put our what-if worries in the hands of the one who does. It doesn't matter how mixed up or complicated the circumstances are. God isn't overwhelmed by them. Let's look at this another way. When circumstances seem impossible, we have a choice. Give in to the what-if fear or trust God's provision and help. We can change our what-if mindset to an even-if trust in God. I'm sure you remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from Sunday School or VBS. The book of Daniel tells the story of these three young Israelites, captives in Babylon, who demonstrated unwavering faith in the face of persecution. They refused to worship the king's idol despite the threat of death by fire. As the three men were being led to the fiery furnace, this is what they said to King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 3, 17 and 18. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. The three young men acknowledge God's power to save and the importance of doing the right thing, no matter what. They accepted God's sovereignty, even if it meant not being delivered from hardship. Their trust in God wasn't conditional on the outcome, but rooted in God's character. In moments of financial anxiety, you can embrace that same trust. In Christ, you can replace your what-if mentality with an even-if trust in God. You can believe that the Lord will give you what you need when you need it, even if it doesn't look exactly the way you planned. So how does even if change those worries we mentioned a few moments ago? What if I lose my job becomes even if I lose my job, I will trust the Lord. What if I can't afford retirement becomes even if I can't afford retirement, I will trust the Lord. What if something bad happens to me or my loved one becomes Even if something bad happens, I will trust the Lord. You see, accepting that God's plans don't always match ours can be challenging. The Bible acknowledges that life will have its worries and doubts. However, faith means trusting God's sovereignty, even if we struggle, knowing He works out all things for our ultimate good. My challenge to you today is to make a list of things you're worried about. Write them out as what-if questions, and then cross out what-if and replace it with even-if. Submit those worries to the Lord, and He will begin to fill your heart with the spirit of power, love, and self-control that His Word promises. God's Word is full of promises for believers who put their complete trust in the Lord. Let me leave you with another one of my favorites from Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 
If you or someone you know struggles with financial anxiety and the what-ifs that lead to fear, visit us at faithfi.com and pick up a copy of our new 21-day devotional, Look at the Sparrows. This resource will reassure and strengthen you with biblical truth and daily spiritual encouragement. Again, it's called Look at the Sparrows, a 21-day devotional on financial fear and anxiety. You'll find it at faithfi.com slash sparrows. That's faithfi.com slash sparrows. Back with your questions after this. Stick around. The opinions offered during this program represent the personal or professional opinions of the participants given for informational purposes only. Any information provided is not intended to replace advice from a financial, medical, legal, or other professional who understands your specific situation. Great to have you with us today on Faith and Finance Live. I'm Rob West. Hey, a big thanks to all of you who participated in our fall share at Moody Radio. What a blessing to hear from hundreds and hundreds, thousands of you that jumped on board and said, we want to stand with you. We love this ministry, and we know the gospel changes everything. A big thanks to those who are regular Faith and Finance Live listeners who jumped in with us as well, whether you were giving for the first time or you've been giving for years, just know that we are incredibly grateful and uh, it's a privilege to partner with you. But we're also glad to be back to regular programming, which means it's time to answer your calls and questions today on anything financial. So if there's something you're wrestling with in your financial life, we'd love to hear from you today. The number to call is 800 525 7,000. You can call right now. Uh, also coming up a little later in the broadcast, Bob Dahl stops by. Bob is our uh, chief uh, uh, economist, if you will, and market guy. He drops in each Monday afternoon to update us on the markets for the week and tell us what he's watching. Bob has a lot to share today, and we'll look forward to getting his take on the state of our economy. But in the meantime, again, you can call right now with your questions, 800 800- Five two five seven thousand. I know the uh, devastation from Hurricane Helene is on your mind. It's weighing on you as it is me. Uh, by the way, if you want to help uh, those in need that have been ravaged by this uh, massive storm, uh, head to ncfgiving.com. That's the National Christian Foundation, ncfgiving.com. You're going to see an article right at the top of the page. It's titled, How to Help Victims of Hurricane Helene. And they did just a masterful job at the National Christian Foundation putting together a list that includes two things. The first piece is a list of all the organizations that are at work on the ground in these communities. Um, And a lot of them uh, national, like American Red Cross and Samaritan's Purse, others more local, like the Asheville Dream Center and Um, You know, organizations you may not be aware of, but they're doing great work right there on the ground. Uh, Convoy of Hope, uh, Faith Works, Hearts with Hands, uh, Mercy Chefs, some incredible organizations that you may want to be aware of uh, that you can find on that page. Again, ncfgiving.com. The other thing that they've done is they've put together specific funds at each of their local NCF affiliates that represent each of the states affected. So there's a fund for Florida. Uh, it's called the Tampa Bay Hurricane Helene Relief Fund. There's a fund for South Georgia, a fund for East Tennessee, and a fund for the Carolinas. And those funds, all the money that comes into those is going out directly to organizations and ministries doing relief work on the ground in each of those areas by state. And so if you have a donor advised fund and you want to transfer some funds there or you just want to give directly, you'll find a listing of each of these donor advised funds where 100 percent of the money is going to be uh, passed off to those organizations doing work in each of these communities. Uh, So, again, check that out, ncfgiving.com. And the article right there at the top of the page is how to help victims of Hurricane Helene. Now, that's uh, how you can help. Now, another side to this story is is a warning, and that's the, the fact that uh, there are scammers that are now out in full force taking advantage of people uh, that uh, are being 
affected uh, by their unscrupulous behavior. Con artists are posing as FEMA or Small Business Administration officials. They're even posing as insurance company employees and even law enforcement to trick folks into giving up payments or personal financial information. I know it's even hard to believe, but uh, let me just remind you, FEMA and the SBA are free, and those suffering uh, hurricane damage should never pay anything if asked to. Also, those uh, in areas hit by the storm should contact their insurance companies before approving or paying for any repair work. Individuals claiming to be contractors and asking for payment up front for repairs could be scammers who will pocket the funds and disappear. Always get references. Don't pay up front for services. Also, um, you know, just be on your guard. Maybe you have a loved one who's in one of these regions. Just alert them to the fact that there are scammers out there trying to take effect, uh, take advantage of people in states affected by Hurricane Helene. So hopefully that's uh, helpful to you as you come alongside loved ones in these areas. All right, we're ready to dive into some questions today. Again, that number, 800-525-7000. Let's go to Wilmington, North Carolina. Hi, David. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right. All right. I enjoy your show very much, sir. It's real informative and it's educational. So thank God for you all. Thank My you very much. My question is, yes, sir. Uh, tithing, you know, in the Old Testament, I know it mentioned tithing. And even today, you know, we are tithing. But in the New Testament, Paul stresses that give as your heart purpose you to give. And I had talked to some people about time, and they say, well, I do like Paul would say, like purpose in my heart. Sometimes I give more, sometimes I give less. But when I make my mind up in my heart, that's how I give. Hmm. Exaggerate on that a little bit. Uh, yeah. I'm here to learn more, you know. Give me your opinion how you feel about that first. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. You're absolutely right in the sense that there is not uh, the same very specific uh, command that we see in the Old Testament. Uh, It's not there in the same way in the New Testament. Uh, There's not the quantitative requirements. It's certainly less prominent. Uh, However, I think it would be a mistake to take that to mean that those of us under the law of Christ who have seen what Christ did on our behalf should be less generous than those who were under the law. I mean, keep in mind, uh, we certainly wouldn't want to be in a position, I don't think, of giving away uh, any less of our income than those who had so much less of an understanding of what God did to save them. And so I think the big idea there is that the tithe becomes kind of a minimum standard, uh, not the standard. Uh, So if we were to summarize everything we see in the New Testament, David, around giving, I think there's four big ideas that jump out at me as I look through uh, the New Testament. Number one is giving freely. So it's not under compulsion where we feel obligated. It's not about a a legalism or checking a box to, quote, do our part. It's giving freely as an overflow or an expression of our gratitude to God. I think the second big idea is proportionate giving. You remember it says in God's Word, to whom much is given, much is required. I think the third idea that we see is that we're to give cheerfully, Remember, in, uh, Paul says we don't want to give un- cheerfully. We don't want to give under compulsion. The word for that is hilarious giving. Again, an overflow of our, our great uh, gratitude to God. And then I think the final big idea is sacrificial giving. Uh, you remember the most famous giver in the New Testament is the widow. We don't know her name, but we know she gave out of her poverty. So I, I think you're right in the sense that there's not that same kind of standard that we're obligated to, but now we have an opportunity, having seen what Christ did on our behalf, to do some hilarious giving. And I think the tithe then becomes the training wheels of giving, the beginning point, not the ending point. Thanks for your call, sir. We'll be right back. Great to have you with us today on Faith and Finance Live. I'm Rob West. We're taking your calls and questions today. Lines are filling up, but we've got room for a few more, 800-525-7000. You can call right now. 
Let's head uh, right back to the phones uh, to Chicago. Hi, Mark. How can I help you? Hey, thanks for taking my call. I um, have a situation I just need uh, just some help overcoming. And uh, let me preface it by saying this this really started in April. Um, April started and I started having some severe health issues. I was suffering from depression, anxiety, some PTSD due to some just some stuff that's been happening over in my life. And over the course of the summer, I ended up missing a, roughly three months of work uh, because of the time off that I had. Um, now I'm now that I'm back to work and doing you know a little bit of overtime here and there, whatever the they ask me, I'm starting to think to myself, how do I make up that money that I lost, you know, during the time I was off? And I'm just having a hard time with that. You know, I, I know that that money is gone. I'll never be able to make it up. No matter how much overtime I make, it'll, you know, it's, it won't, it won't cover it, but it's also, well, you'd have had this overtime anyway with it. So I'm really having a, uh, a little tough time trying to get to myself saying it's gone. Don't think about it. Move forward and we'll go from here. And I also do want to say that God did provide during that time that we, we didn't have my paycheck coming in, never missed a meal, never missed a mortgage payment or anything. Wow. Yeah. Well, Mark, I appreciate that. You know, I think we have to take a step back and realize that every dollar we have everything we have, including our bodies, our very life, is a gift from God. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, asked the question uh, to the, when he's writing to the church at Corinth, what do you, do, what do you have that you weren't given? And, and I think the idea is, the obvious answer is nothing, because everything belongs to God, including us. And so our responsibility is to faithfulness, Faithfulness to opportunity, faithfulness to whatever passes through our hands, whatever the Lord gives us. And that includes faithfulness in those seasons where there's a lack. And to your point, I mean, you had to, you had some health, health issues. You had to take some time off. There was lost income there. But I think ultimately when we recognize that God is our provider, and I appreciate you giving testimony to God's faithfulness, even when it didn't make sense, even through a difficult season where income dries up, you didn't miss any payments. And I think, you know, that's a direct evidence of God's provision and faithfulness in your life. And so I think trying to, you know, move that uh, concern around what was lost and what I gave up to gratitude for God as your provider, because remember, it's not your employer's not your provider, not the U.S. government, not anyone or anything else, but God himself. Uh, it says even the power to create wealth comes from God. And so I think, you know, the, the idea that we need to shift toward is toward the goodness of God. His promises are true. He will never leave us or forsake us. Look at the birds of the air. If he's going to provide for them, how much more would he not provide for you, his child? And so once we've surrendered our lives to him as Lord and Savior, then it's a matter of leaning into our responsibility of stewardship and even those difficult seasons that when they come, we say, I will trust the Lord. And, you know, we saw that, we talked about that in the opening of today's broadcast that, you know, with the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, they said, listen, even if God does not ref- rescue us, we will not worship your gods or your gold statue. We will worship the one true king. And I think that's the opportunity we have. And so, Perhaps there's a shift that needs to occur, and I'm talking to myself at the same time, in our minds away from not what did I lose or what did I give up or what did I miss out on, but God, thank you that you can be trusted as my provider, and now what can I do moving forward to be that wise and faithful steward as I see your provision coming in uh, to, to save for the future, to continue to give generously, to live within my means? but also to continue recognizing that God owns it all. And with that means I need to accept my role as steward. And there are implications to stewardship. You don't have ownership rights and neither do I. We have a responsibility. We need to be faithful in a little as well as faithful in much. Uh, We need to give generously because giving 
causes us to hold everything with an open hand and recognize God as our provider. Uh, you know, all of these ideas, I think, are implications to God, you know, ultimately being the one who is our provider above anything else. But is that helpful at all? Yeah, actually, it is. You know, throughout this whole um, time that I was off, my wife kept on reminding me, uh, Mark, we're going to get through this. Mark, we, you know, we've been through this before with your, you know, with your foot surgery seven years ago. We went yeah. through this before, you know, and God always provided for us. He's not going to stop now. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. And the biggest thing I learned through all this is to rely more on God just in everything and not rely more on man. Even though I yeah. went to a, through a man-made um, program at the hospital, I, what God was trying to tell me is, yeah, that program will give you a little bit, but I'll give you what you really need. Yes. And that's the thing that I really learned through this whole journey. Yes. Well, that's a good word, and I'll just remind you where we started today. You know, God's Word is full of promises for His people who put their complete trust in the Lord. Uh, Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So we need to recognize God's plans don't always match ours. The Bible acknowledges that life will have its worries and troubles. You've experienced them. I have as well. However, faith means trusting in God's sovereignty, even if we struggle. Uh, let's do this, Mark. Uh, we just produced uh, a brand new 21-day devotional called Look at the Sparrows. Uh, I'd love for you to go on that journey over the next three weeks as you start each day uh, with a different passage of Scripture, a short devotional, some Scripture memory, and a few exercises just to remind yourself uh, to transfer your sights away from your present circumstances, put them back on God as your ultimate treasure. I want to send that to you as our gift. I'd love for you to go through it and then call us at the end. Hang on the line. We'll get your information and get Look at the Sparrows out to you. We'll be right back. Great to have you with us today on Faith and Finance Live. I'm Rob West. We're taking your calls and questions today. Also, coming up in our next segment, our final segment today, Bob Dahl stops by with a, an important question. What kind of landing will we have on this uh, economy? Will it be a hard landing, a soft landing, maybe a, a bumpy landing? Or is there a possibility no landing at all, meaning this market that has been red hot over the past year, despite the looming recession that we haven't fully gotten yet, although some would argue we've had pieces of it. Uh, are we just going to keep you know, riding high from here? Uh, Bob will uh, give us his take on all of that just around the corner. In the meantime, let's head back to the phones. Uh, Kansas City is where we're going next. Hi, Joe. Welcome to the uh, broadcast today. How can I serve you? Yes, sir. I appreciate it. I appreciate your program. I listen to you all the time. Used to, Thank you. Used to listen to Larry Burkett years Excellent. ago. Excellent. Oh, I love um, that. Yeah. Um, my question is, I have two insurance policies, and they are burial policies for my wife and I. Um, they're about $200 uh, between the two a month. And I'm just questioning, they're, they're $25,000 each. I'm just questioning whether I would be better off just to take that uh, take that money and, and, you know, put it in four, just add it to my investments, the 401ks or whatever. Yeah. Um, or, or am I better off keeping the insurance? I'm, I'm 63. My wife is 65. Um, okay. you yeah. know, we're, we're in pretty good health. Uh, but, uh, I hope we, you know, have a, quite a few more years before that would be necessary. Sure. Uh, let me ask you, uh, you said there's 200 a month for both 50,000 in total death benefits. So you're, you're spending 2,400 a year on this. Is this a permanent policy where there's a, a portion of it that's going into a savings account or is it just purely for the death benefit? It's just for the death benefit. Yeah. I mean, that's really expensive, um, for a very little bit of death benefit. I mean, $2,400 a year. How long have you been paying on this? Um, probably about three years. Okay. So you've got 7,500 in. I mean, if you all were to live, uh, you know, another 10 years, 
um, you know, you'll have another 25,000, that's 35,000 of the 50. And that's if both of you pass away in 10 years. So I, I guess my question is, I'm always careful to say, yeah, just drop the policy. Cause I mean, if something were to happen to you, I want to make sure there's not a legitimate risk there. But uh, let me ask you, if one of you were to pass away, the Lord were to call you home, uh, are there assets there that could be tapped to pay for the, uh, the burial and funeral expenses, or is there a legitimate need there? Well, there, there is. Um, I've got, I have a four, well, kind of a, let's see, I have an IRA that's about, it's about 60,000 and then a 401k that's, I've got 15. My wife has a couple that are in probably the 40 range. Um, so there's about what, 120, uh, total asset there. Um, and then my, I, I, I'm a retired firefighter, so I, I receive a pension, and my wife would get half of that at uh, you know at my leaving, and then she would have Social Security. So yeah. it's not like we'd be without without anything. Um, that's kind of what I as I started putting the numbers together. It's kind of where I came up with maybe it'd be better off, and then I could do that tax deferred, just put that money in saving or put that money in you know up and. Yeah, I mean, I'd feel personally a lot better as long as you just recognize you're losing that death benefit. So if you, one of you pass away tomorrow, there's no twenty five thousand, uh, which means now you're going to have to come out of pocket for those burial expenses. But I think the the likelihood of that, I mean, that's a very low risk. Although none of us know the day or the hour the Lord will call us home, but that's a very low risk. And the idea that you could get another you know, roughly $2,500 a year going in on a tax deferred basis that you all could have full access to, um, you know, when you need it, that feels like a much better use of that money for me. I think, I think I agree with you. Could I ask you another question while I have you on the phone? All right. Today only we're given two questions. So you go right ahead. Uh, Okay. (laughs) Well, I I know you talked about a, uh, when you, when you give, and I forget what you call it. Um, uh, like you, you take, you give your money out of say a four hundred one k, where you don't, you don't have to pay taxes on that. Yes. Um, what is, what is that called again? Yeah, it's not a four hundred one k. So it's a qualified charitable distribution, which is probably what you're referring to. But it only applies to an IRA. Now here's where it indirectly relates to a four hundred one k. Is most people save in their four hundred one k during their working years. Then when they retire and separate from service, they roll that 401k out to an IRA because that's not a taxable event. It keeps it in a tax-deferred environment. And then once you're 70 and a half or older from an IRA, not a 401k, but from an IRA, you can do a qualified charitable distribution directly from your IRA to a not-for-profit 501c3 ministry or your church. And that is not added to your taxable income. It's the only way to get money out of an IRA without paying tax on it. Is is that um, can you is that you have to do that in a lump sum one time a year or is that no something like I no no you you can do it as many basis? times as you want. You could do it on a monthly basis. You just can't go over the limit for the year, and you do have to be seventy and a half at a minimum. But as long as you're seventy and a half, the the maximum for the year is a hundred and five thousand dollars. So you got plenty of room, uh, and you could do it in as many payments as you want, or one lump payment. Uh, it just can't be more than a hundred and five total. Right. Okay. But you got to be seventy and a half. You got to be seventy and a half in order to do it. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. I thank you. Thanks for taking the second question. <laughs> I was joking, but you're very welcome. Thanks for calling and thanks for mentioning uh, the late Larry Briquette. We always love talking about Larry. All right, let's go to Hawaii. Beautiful Hawaii. Hi, Lori. How can we help? Hi, Rob. Aloha from Hawaii. Aloha. Um, yeah, thank you for taking my call. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, we're at the point in our lives where we need to downsize. And so I was wondering if when we sell our house, which is our primary residence, um, and we want to purchase another house, uh, do we need to tithe on our sale prior to investing in another primary residence? I love this question. You sound like a, a wonderful, generous saint and Christ follower. And I'm thrilled to hear that. You know, here's the way we approach giving. If you want to apply the principle of the tithe, uh, you would apply it to your increase. 
So the question would be with the sale of any asset, including your home, what is my increase? And your increase would be the difference between the selling price and the purchase price. And so you would you would take the selling price, you would subtract your purchase price, and then if you all made any major improvements to the property that increased the value, like you added a bathroom or you put an addition on, not maintenance, but real improvements, then you'd subtract that as well, and then you'd be left with your true increase in the value of that asset. Just happened to be where you were living, but it's an asset. And if you wanted to give a tithe to the Lord on the increase, which is how we talk about the tithe that was based on the increase, that's the number that you would apply the 10% to. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, yes, I understand. Okay. Selling price minus the purchase price when you originally bought it minus any improvements equals the gain or the increase. And then you would give 10% of that away. So it wouldn't, now you can't outgive God. And if the Lord were to leave you to lead you to give 10% of the entire thing, go for it. But if you're trying to apply the principle of the tithe, you would only look at what is my true increase on this asset. And that, that would be the calculation to determine it. And then you'd give 10% of that number. Hey, Lori, thanks for calling today from Hawaii. We appreciate it. God bless you. We'll be right back. This is Faith and Finance Live. I'm Rob West. We're so glad you're along today. We're taking your calls and questions. But here in our final segment, Bob Dahl is here. Bob is a Chief Investment Officer at Crossmark Global Investments, where investments and values intersect. He joins us with his market commentary each Monday afternoon. And Bob, here's the big question. I know it was right there at the top of the page for your deliberations this week. U.S. economy, will it be a hard landing, a soft landing, a bumpy landing, or could it be no landing at all, Bob? What say you? Or, or maybe all of the above. All of the above. It is. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like a true economist now, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. On the one hand, on the other, I've got four hands. Um, I think most likely is a bumpy landing, Rob, uh, where uh, we'll debate is it a, a soft landing? Are we heading for a recession? And that debate will likely continue. And we've seen some of that, where some industries have had a hard time, other industries have done well, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my, my second choice, if to put probabilities on it, sadly, is still a hard landing where um, the Fed tightening of the last few years just um, does us in and slows the economy more than we think and begins to affect earnings even more. Yeah, no question about it. Bob, I know you've said for some time now your assessment of this market is what you call a high-risk, momentum-driven bull market, which doesn't give us a whole lot of confidence this is going to continue. So make the case on either side of this. What would be the, the one or two things that really concern you? And then what about the positives? Well, on the positive side, we've already mentioned it. It's the slowing economy. We're seeing, despite the great labor report from last Friday, we're still seeing labor market deterioration. Uh, earnings expectations are still too high. And then you couple that with the high valuation levels. And you know, we've talked about this uh, back to you know high-risk momentum-driven bull market. Um, uh, you know, you, you, you have your risk if you're there, but you got to be there. Uh, the positives, inflation's come down a lot. It may have not reached the Fed's 2% target, uh, but it's come, come a long way. And, of course, the Fed is now lowering rates to fight potential economic weakness. Um, and uh, while earnings estimates are falling, uh, the consensus still is double-digit earnings growth for this year, next year, and the year after. Wow. Uh, we've never had two in a row absent a recession, <laughs> let alone three in a row. We'll see. Right. Yeah, no question. You hear, my, you, hear, you hear my skepticism. Yeah, I absolutely do, and I would share that. Bob, I've gotten more than than a few calls lately from people, especially with the election right around the corner. And these are, you know, Christ followers just wanting to honor the Lord with what he's entrusted to them. And they're saying, Rob, I'm just really concerned about where we might be headed, depending on the outcome of the election, regardless of— you know, which side of that you're on. And I'm thinking about just getting out because what if, and then they start down that road. What, what do you say to those folks? 
So I say to those folks, first of all, um, the, our president is not our savior. Um, uh, he or she is a messed up sinner like all of us. Uh, we, we trust in the Lord. I know that's a spiritual answer, so let me bring yeah. it down to earth a little bit uh, by saying um, there have been lots of times when uh, we've been heading in the wrong direction, but markets eventually uh, uh, do better. If you read our election piece, Rob, you know that our concern for the market would be if we have unified government, especially if it's unified Democratic, but I think uni- unified Republican, that is the House, the Senate, and the presidency, I don't think the market would like that much either. Uh, much either. We're likely to have divided government, and markets can cope with that because yeah. it takes away the extreme potential legislation. Mm. Bob, despite our headwinds, and we certainly have them, I mean, we've got geopolitical risk, we've got bigger macro trends, we're not having enough babies to replace the workers that are retiring. What case would you still make for the U.S. economy over the long haul? So slower than where many of us grew up for the reasons you just said, but productivity has uh, has bailed us out often and uh, a fair amount. Um, you know, I don't want to overly get excited about um, AI. That's the talk of the day. It is already and will continue to give us a productivity boost when we need it from time to time. So uh, our economy um, uh, is uh, long term going to be slower, as I said, uh, but still be a positive and earnings growth should follow. Yeah. Uh, Bob, let's finish with values-based or faith-based investing. I know we talk a lot about screening out companies that are misaligned with those listening who hold to Christian values, but there's an equally compelling opportunity to screen in those companies that are promoting good and human flourishing in the world, right? I absolutely agree with you. Uh, While every uh, company that's in this space does the exclusionary part a little differently, um, we have common views in general, but it's the more interesting side Not that not every firm is paying attention to, and that is the positive. Uh, What companies can I own that have reasonably priced stocks, good cash flow, good management, et cetera, but they're also doing good and the way they treat their employees their their uh their 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 suppliers their customers their community their environment um these are the ones that uh, are uh, advancing the kingdom excellent love it all right my friend thanks for your time today we always appreciate it have a great week all right that's bob Dahl. he uh, stops by each monday with his market commentary he's Chief Executive Officer and Chief Investment Officer at Crossmark Global Investments. You can sign up for his weekly market commentary, Dolls Deliberations, crossmarkglobal.com. All right, back to the phones today. Let's round out the broadcast today in Chicago. Christine, how can we serve you? Good afternoon. Um, thank you for taking my call, and I appreciate your program. You. Um, my question is, I'm 64 years old, and I have a significant amount of money in IRA CDs, and I was considering taking the money out little by little every year um, to have more liquid assets. And I understand that when I take the money out, that that goes towards my annual income. What I wanted to know was, is there another way to withdraw the money to lessen the taxes that I have to pay? Um, yeah, there, not- there really isn't, Christine. I mean, let me give you a few thoughts. Um, but overall, uh, apart from giving it away chari- charitably, it's going to be recognized as income as it comes out. Now, you could be strategic about when you pull it out. So if in one particular year you had more income than another year, you might try to wait and you know take it as you turn the clock into a new calendar year if you had the ability to defer when you recognize it because you pay tax on it in the year it comes out. Uh, so you could be a little more thoughtful about when you take it out and if you have the the flexibility to make sure that you get it into that tax year where your income is as low as possible so that you're not pushing any portion of it up into a higher tax bracket. Um, The other approach would be once you're 70 and a half, and I realize you're not there yet, um, but that's going to be another opportunity for you because through the qualified charitable distribution, if you're doing any charitable giving 
out of your cash or your checking account or savings account like most of us. So when when we write a check to our church or we support Moody Radio or, or something like that, you know, we typically write a check or, you know, put our debit card in and make a gift. Well, what if you did the same giving you were already planning to do out of your cash after tax dollars, um, but instead you sent it from your IRA? Well, if it went from your IRA directly to your church or charity, now it's not added to your taxable income. So you're, in a sense, replacing the money that you were already going to give with after-tax dollars, and you're giving the same amount from your IRA, except now it's coming out with you, without you having to pay any tax on it. Again, you can't do that until you're 70 and a half, but when that time comes, that would be a great way for you to get money out without it um, you know, increasing your tax liability. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you for answering my question. Um, I appreciate your help. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. God bless you. We appreciate you being on the program today. Uh, Raymond is in Longview. And and Raymond, I don't think I'm going to have enough time to adequately answer your question. So I would see, I would love to see if we can get you up first on the broadcast tomorrow. I know you want, uh, are looking for some tips on how to save and um, balance a budget with a single income, raising a family. And I know that's challenging now more than ever with uh, expenses up across the board. And so let's brainstorm on that together, perhaps tomorrow, if we can get you up first uh, on the broadcast. Stay right there. Our team will work with you and we'll get you scheduled for tomorrow. You know, folks, let's finish where we started today. We talked about the fact that one of the enemy's favorite tools for discouraging God's people is this question, what if? which leads us right down the road to fear. Fear is a spiritual trap because it takes our eyes off the goodness of God and places them on our circumstances. We can't control the future, but we certainly like to worry about it, don't we? And God knows this about us, and that's why he reminded us, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or you'll drink or about your body. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And um, what I would say as we wrap up today is, yes, God can be trusted. Let's shift our minds mindset away from what if to trusting fully in God and His provision and recognizing that despite the fact that we will go through difficult times, um, you know, we can trust the Lord. His promises are true, and, um, you know, we need to replace that fear with faith. I also would remind you that that was exactly why we produced this brand new 21-day devotional here at Faith Vi called Look at the Sparrows. Um, it was designed to be an encouragement to you over a three-week period to help you refocus on the goodness of God each day to start your day with a scripture passage, a short devotional, some scripture memorization and a short exercise, also a declaration that I think just emphasizes God's care and love for you and his promises and his provision. If you'd like to check it out with a gift of uh, $25 or more to FaithFi, we'd love to send it to you. It's just our way of saying thanks for being a part of what we're doing. I'm confident it'll be an encouragement to you. You'll be blessed by it. Uh, just head to our website, faithfi.com slash sparrows. That's faithfi.com slash sparrows. Faith and Finance Live is a partnership between Moody Radio and Faith Fi. Thank you to our team today, including our call screeners, also Amy, Dan, and Jim. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.